It's wonderful to gather with you. It's wonderful to gather with people of such wonderful talents and gifts. People who don't even realize it. It's wonderful to gather with those who don't even realize the influence they have on other people. They don't realize the small moments of kindness, the difference they make, the smile that they have, their intelligence, their, their curiosity, their spontaneity. They don't realize these wonderful gifts and the influence they have. And I hope tonight when we think about particularly the parable of the leaving or the parable of the yeast, we'll begin to see how through God these things are making a huge difference, even or whether we realize it or not. Dear God, we gather tonight. We gather with your good and faithful servants like Elaine and Marjorie. We give you such thanks, God, for giving us Adam and Angela and Gordon and Susan to lead our worship. What uplifting joy it is. We give you thanks for people who have graced this church in the past and who grace it now. And Lord God, we ask and pray for continued blessings for new people to come. To inspire us and work within us. As we all work to bring the kingdom of heaven here on earth. So on this night, when there are loved ones in hospital. On this night when some of us may be full of concerns. On this night when we may worry about what lies ahead in the next week. We come before you to offer this time to you. To the God of all goodness. To the God with the plan. To the God who gives us hope. So now we come to worship him. Amen.
So tonight we are, we're going to be, well, thinking about four parables, all about the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says at the beginning of Luke's gospel, he says that the kingdom of heaven is near. But we know that the kingdom is still to fully come. So when we pray the perfect prayer, the Lord's prayer, we'll hear, of course, and say again these words, your kingdom come. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for the joy here tonight. Thank you for the fun. Thank you for the happiness. Thank you for people that we love spending time with. Thanks for those we can talk about cycling with. Or the football. Or trips to Blackpool. God, you know what you're doing. Thank you for the many gifts that you give us. Lord God, you give us so much. And yet we take so much for granted. Forgive those of us here who have had or have marriages that are, they just work. We don't thank you enough, God. Those of us here tonight who have children and they're safe and well, we don't thank you enough. Thank you, God, and forgive us. Those of us here who have grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. We're so lucky, God. We give you such thanks. Forgive us when we don't come to you in thanks enough. Forgive us when we don't thank you for our health. For all the things we're capable of doing. Especially when we know tonight that there are those who are unwell. Help us not to take your gifts for granted. For those of us who have holidays planned, we thank you. You give us so much. And forgive us when we fail to come back to you and appreciate all we have. We thank you, God, for the gift of new starts, new challenges in our life, things to excite us. You are so good to us. Forgive us, God, when we take for granted all that we have, the food in our cupboards, the packed fridge, the freezer, the contents of which we've forgotten half. And so help the story of Esther Saizi and the work of Christian aid tonight humble us and make us repent and help us to see again what we can do so that your kingdom comes. And so in whichever words we are most comfortable with, whether we are at home or here tonight, we pray the words that Jesus Christ taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven,
This Sunday is the beginning of Christian Aid Week and our own Christian Aid Week will culminate next Saturday morning with a quiz at Trinity Church at 10 o'clock which Jim will be running so all are welcome to come next Saturday at 10 o'clock, Saturday morning 10 o'clock. There are also donation envelopes and quizzes on sale as well. And what we're going to do now is just to show, Adam's going to show us a very short video of a lady called Esther Saizi, who lives in Malawi, apparently a wonderful woman. And it's going to be a story of Esther Saizi and the great success of pigeon peas. Welcome to Malawi, the warm heart of Africa. Stay tuned for your Christian Aid Week broadcast. Rising food and energy prices are impacting millions across the world. Economists point to COVID, the war in Ukraine, and poor harvests as the cause. And now, a short ad break. Bread prices up by 50% in just three months? Our tasty locally produced rolls could be the solution. Esther is here to serve you delicious rolls straight from her cooperative's oven. No need to travel, our team will come to you. Esther's rolls are baked using flour made from locally grown pigeon peas. So there's no expensive fuel related costs to hike up the price. And no need for costly imported wheat. Thanks to pigeon peas, awesome drought resistant properties, Everyone can enjoy them when other crops fail. But hurry, Esther's rolls are selling like hot cakes. They are loved by adults and children alike. Esther's little grandson, Nespo, can't get enough. Your family will love them too. Next on Christian Aid Week TV, it's Esther's story. Ene abambo Adam Garira, Chakashata. Zina ndirengira po masiku, angabo nditu, kuti ndirimbe. Munga mkuzi wa kuti wina akashoga, niti mama kala osweka. Choncho, siri matatsiku, asa nabwele mtu, ozabe mpela banyumba bana. Olu haku mpengo kumini, ama taku mwela, uzabe angama mpelo, banyumba bano, Molmogodin and the end in the pit of Charish. Did you so much your Kaja and Bui? Emwe and a wizard is some far worse on to be more. Come as Nadis into Zolpe Sajison, no Zolanda Ola, no Landa Olis. Come on, children be kids so much chas in Zanga, my neighbors. I got your cock wear at Zikes up and was a gambank and his old sega, showing a yogu in a Kokumu Ranga, the one thing they are now weary at Scano Kawok. This is who's weary than your mother to Karok. Minama de Sia Kakashata. Mao marries an antisilon in a woody Anna Usa Maria Usa Watai. Chief Kananga Sinda joined a project in Osa Kalisa among Kumatia. I was in the Farmers Association. I was in the Giriza. 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 The one for Wakonda. The Mutima Manga Mutima Fabu no Dimazita put in one call. In Enzuku Wanga, Nima Munya did a one pity. Uncle Funas Bangizo Zauka Ventara. 
Give today and help more families have a better future. Visit caweek.org. Okay, everybody. And that's a wrap. The fields are ruined. The ground is dried up. The grain is destroyed. The new wine is dried up. The olive oil fails. Despair, you farmers. Wail, you vine growers. Grieve for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree is withered. The pomegranate, the palm, and the apple tree, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the people's joy is withered away. And then moving to Joel chapter 2, reading at verse 18. Then the Lord was jealous for his land and took pity on his people. The Lord replied to them, I am sending you grain, new wine and olive oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. I will drive the northern horde far from you, pushing it into a parched and barren land. Its eastern ranks will drown in the Dead Sea and its western ranks in the Mediterranean Sea. And its stench will go up, its smell will rise. Do not be afraid, land of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Do not be afraid, you wild animals, for the pastures in the wilderness are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit, the fig tree and the vine yield their riches. Be glad, people of Zion, rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains because he is faithful. He sends you abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains, as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locust and the young locust, the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. You will have plenty to eat until you are full, and you will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you will know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord, your God, and that there is no other. Never again will my people be shamed. And afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And the New Testament we're reading from Matthew chapter 13, the parables of the mustard seed and the yeast. We're reading verses 31 to 35. He told them another parable. 
The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Amen. Lord God, at the end of the day, when many of us are wearying, help us to hear your word and help me to speak clearly. Help me to speak well. Beyond the preparation I've done, but just through you, who does incredible things. So be with us now as we hear your word. Amen. So we are going to look again at Matthew chapter 13, specifically Matthew chapter 13, verse 32, verse 33, I think, the parable of the yeast or the parable of the leaven. Um, and we're going to do it, we're going to start by a little reminder of what's happening in Matthew chapter 13. So we're going to we're going to set the context for it. We're going to briefly look at the three other parables that are in have been in Matthew chapter 13 before this, before looking at the parable of the yeast or the parable of the leaven. And what I want to what I'd hope to get to the point of is to get to the point where each one of us can see What influence we can have with others right now. What we can do from the position we are in right now. Even when we may think we don't know how to influence others. When we don't know how to get through to each other. When we don't know how to make a difference. What I'm hoping to show is that we can see from whatever position we're in now. Through God's grace. We can influence others in the most wonderful way. So, let me very briefly just remind us or explain. In Matthew's Gospel, he speaks often of the kingdom of heaven. And the kingdom of heaven, as it's described in in the other Gospels, the kingdom of God, is essentially those on earth who are putting their trust in God. Those who are believing in God, who have, who have committed to follow Jesus Christ, we can understand as the kingdom of heaven. God's word here on earth. And the disciples have heard Jesus speak often of the kingdom of heaven. And I don't think the disciples are doubting that Jesus is the king. Or they've heard enough to think, yes, he's the Messiah. They've seen miracles done. They've seen the most incredible words said. But yet the disciples keep on having doubts. He, he seems like the Messiah, but is he really? And it seems a big part of the disciples' doubts is because they're not seeing the kingdom come at all. They're seeing Jesus do incredible things, but they're not seeing the kingdom come, at least in the way they'd expect it. What they're seeing, in fact, is that those who are rejecting Jesus becoming more and more confident. And that goes against what they would understand. What they're seeing now is Jesus telling them, instead of saying he's going to deal with everyone who's against him, he's going to say, no, actually, they're going to kill me. So the disciples at this point seem to be going through a rather hard time, doubting whether indeed the kingdom of heaven is coming at all, doubting indeed whether Jesus really is the Messiah. In the previous chapter, Matthew chapter 12, we've had Jesus being accused of doing the work of Beelzebub. And we've had people plotting now to kill him. 
So the disciples are going through an incredibly hard time because they're just not seeing the kingdom come, at least as they understood it. In fact, it's not just them. If, you, if I just read these words from Luke 17, verse 20, when the Pharisees are speaking to Jesus, they say to him, when is the kingdom of God going to come? Even there, they, they don't see anything. They don't see a difference. When is the kingdom of God going to come? I mean, you say you're the king. You go parading around that you're the king. But when are you going to bring the kingdom? And Jesus replies to them, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. So it's in this context of the disciples doubting and going through a hard time and trying to understand what's happening that Jesus tells these parables in Matthew chapter 13. That he, there's still the crowds around and he gets in the boat and speaks to them in parables. And the first parable, he says, is the parable of the farmer. And we know it's a well-known parable, the, par the parable of the farmer who has the seeds, and he scatters the seeds everywhere. Throughout all the land, the farmer scatters the seeds. Some lands on paths, and the birds come and eat it up, and birds come and take the seeds. Some, some lands on the rocky soil, and it grows. The, 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 the plants grow, but the soil's too thin, so it, it doesn't take long that the plants wither. Some lands in the thorny ground, and after a while, the thorns over, overwhelm all the, the new plants. And only some land on the good land. And there, the most wonderful plants grow up. And what Jesus seems to be saying there and telling the disciples is that now people are going to reject me. Not everyone is going to believe me. In fact, three quarters of the land that Jesus talks about there rejects him. And that's Jesus in person. That is Jesus, that they're witnessing and seeing miracles. And Jesus says, so many people, they're going to reject me. You need to know that. And we know that as well. There was a, an interview, many of you will know Tim Keller, the, 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 the American pastor, great pastor. And he, he ran until recently this huge church in Manhattan. And there was an interviewer who was who was fawning over him saying it's incredible people say you can never plant a church in Manhattan that people are never going to believe in it yet you've got thousands coming every week you see and he says what's your secret and he says well in Manhattan you know thousands come but millions don't <laughs> and, it, and it was true and it was a very humble answer but it was also a very true answer yeah thousands come to the biggest church in Manhattan thousands come but millions don't millions don't What's the, that, that hymn that we sing? One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. But still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. Jesus is saying to us, people will reject me. You have to know that. This is what the kingdom of heaven is going to be like now. Then he tells another story. The kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who plants wheat. And then at night, the enemy comes and plants weeds all around the wheat. And the farmhands say, what should we do with these weeds? Should we pull them up? And Jesus says, no, don't. Just leave them all. Because you might accidentally pull up wheat at the same time. Just leave them all till the harvest. And what Jesus is saying to us there is don't judge others. You don't know what's happening. You don't know what you're doing. You might make a mistake. Don't judge others. My job is to judge others. I'll deal with that. Your job is to be the wheat amongst the weeds. Your job is just to influence, to be the wheat amongst the weeds. To be the kingdom of heaven here on earth. And then Jesus begins to tell these two hopeful parables. The Lindsay Redfords, the parable of the mustard seed. And this is the parable to encourage the disciples that when they're surrounded by persecution and ridicule and hatred, that even though things are going to start small, great things will happen. We saw that illustrated there in the story of Esther Saizi and our pigeon peas. Just from a wee small pigeon pea, great things have happened. But I'm going to move on to the parable of the yeast. I'm going to try and explain this so I feel well outside my comfort zone talking about bread. But I'm going to try my very best. And 
In other translations, it's not called the parable of the yeast. It's called the parable of the leaven. L-E-A-V-E-N. And I think that's more accurate and more helpful to help us understand what is in this parable. So I see this and I try and introduce this as someone who's, who's made two loaves of bread in my life. Um, but I, I was given this book a couple of Christmases ago and I thought, brilliant, it's flour, water, salt, yeast. The Fundamentals of Artisan Bread and Pizza. Now, I feel so nervous standing in front of you speaking about how to make bread. It's, it's that old, what is it, teaching your granny to knit. But this is roughly, and I, I started to read this, I thought, great, I'm going to make this. But I got put off because it's all about leaven. And people will know this about sourdough bread. And this is, I think, the, the kind of bread we're talking about. That you make sourdough bread, I, I'm going to explain this wrong, I'm sure. But you, you make a batch of bread, you make all your dough, you make your bread, but you take a little bit of that dough and keep it aside. And that's going to be what you call your master dough, or your mother dough. And then so long as you keep adding new flour to it all the time, this can last forever. And so you have bakers that have had the same mother dough for hundreds of years. And they just take the mother dough, so then they get a new batch of bread, they put it all together, they take the leaven, and they put a bit of the leaven in from the, from the mother dough, mix it all in, and make their bread. And so this mother dough, I'm losing myself. This mother dough can, is, is what they use to make all the rest of the bread from now on, from now on, from now on. And that is how they used to do it in Jesus' time. And the, the Jews still do it. It makes sense to them. It's tradition in a Jewish wedding that uh, the Jewish mum would give the daughter some of the leaven from the family mother dough. And the idea is that the daughter will take this into creating her new family and is taking the good from the past into the new. So they understand this idea of leaving in Jewish culture. And in what, what Lindsay read, Lindsay read the story that he said that the kingdom of heaven is like someone who takes some leaven and mixes it in with 30 kilograms of flour, which is a huge amount, 30 kilograms of flour, and mixes it in and keeps on working it till it's worked all the way through. And that is, it seems like a huge amount, but I was reading this week, John MacArthur, I was reading, who was pointing out that this is, these amounts are used before in the, in the Bible, in Genesis 18, when, when the Lord and two angels come to Sarah and Abraham and tell them the great news about Isaac. That they say, go make Sarah, go make some bread. And Sarah goes and makes some bread and she gets the leaven and she mixes it in with 30 kilograms of flour. So that is something that's happened in the Bible before. Indeed, in Judges chapter 6, there's the story of Gideon. And again, that bread was prepared in the same amounts with the leaven mixed in with the 30 kilograms of flour. And what leaven is, is it's fermented sourdough from a former loaf. And it's been left out so that it will ferment and it, it acts like a yeast and it causes the leavening of the bread. Now, leaven is a positive thing. It's a good thing because you can imagine bread without, without yeast is dry and hard and not very tasty. And I'll just show you this. This is the kind of picture that inspired me. Whereas bread with leaven or with yeast kind of looks like something like that, which looks like very nice bread. So... Leaving is a positive thing. And it's the idea, as I say, from the, the, the Jewish idea that you take the leaven and it continues a tradition. Now, there's one example in the Bible, or at least one example, where bread that is used is unleavened. And the example comes in, as we know, the story of the Passover, when the Israelites had to leave Egypt and God had told them, you know, to, to mark on the, on the doors and, and things like that. And God said, you're going to mark this by having a festival of unleavened bread. For five days, for seven days, you're going to eat bread that is unleavened. And the reason that God said that was symbolic. It's as if saying, no, you're going now to the promised land. Leave behind the slavery and everything that went before. I don't want you to take the leaven from before. You are starting again. It's symbolic. So it's the one time God didn't want to take from, from before and carry it into the new. Because the Israelites had, as we know, so many problems in the wilderness wanting to go back to Egypt. And so God was saying, no, this is a new start. You're going to have unleavened bread. Do people feel I've understood unleavened bread? <laughs> You're being so polite. 
Um, okay, so let me try and explain a little bit about why the kingdom of heaven is like the leaven that is mixed into bread. So what you do with leaven is that leaven has to be put in with the dough. It has to be inserted into the dough. You can't just leave it aside. You have to put it in and you have to mix it in. And this is what God did. God didn't come to the world by just standing on a cloud and, and shouting down and saying, this is going to happen. He didn't do that. He, he injected the leaven, as it were. He sent his son down for us to live amongst us. The leaven, the kingdom of heaven. Now, going back to, thinking back to the Christmas story, in what object, if this question makes sense, in what object, if we think of Jesus as the beginning of the kingdom of heaven on earth, in what object did the kingdom of heaven begin in? In what object was Jesus born in? A manger. It's like God is saying, I am going to start as small as possible. I'm going to start this in a place where you feed animals. And I'm going to do this in the most obscure part of the Roman Empire. And this this baby is going to grow up. This baby is going to grow up and for 30 years is going to be in Nazareth. And is going to watch his mommy make bread. And is going to learn how the leaven goes into the bread. And is going to be seeing, okay, I can use that to explain to people what the kingdom of heaven's like. For 30 years that Jesus would have been watching farmers sow seeds. We'd understand about weeds and wheat. And then working as it was like the leaven working within the dough. Then the disciples come along. Tax collectors like Matthew and fishermen. But all the time from small things, great things are happening. And Jesus was telling this parable of the leaven to encourage the disciples to try and say this little bit of leaven is going to influence the whole world. The kingdom of heaven, barely seen, will be planted in the middle of the world and it will influence all of the world. And then those of us who believe in Jesus Christ become part of the kingdom of heaven. And we are now those who can do this influencing. Leslie Newbigin said the reason Jesus has not come again to bring his kingdom is to allow the church more time to bring more people to Jesus Christ. We are the leaven. We are the kingdom of heaven that influences now the world. So in spite of the weeds, In spite of the birds that snatch the seed, in spite of the sun that spoils the seeds, there's still some good soil. In spite of the presence of weeds, the wheat grows. And despite all the evil opposition, the mustard seed grows and the leaven influences. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not hold it in. And everything Jesus said in these parables, that people would reject me. Everything Jesus said in these parables, that the kingdom of heaven will start small and will influence the whole world. It's all true. We can see it's true. And so do we trust Jesus Christ that he has this plan and Jesus knows what he is doing? And do we believe, even from a small beginning, from wherever we are now, we can work and we can influence others so much? I finished this morning with words from J.C. Ryle, and I'm going to do the same again. J.C. Ryle wrote about the kingdom of heaven some 150 years ago. And I'm going to read these words because they're words of encouragement for us. For us to truly believe the influence we have on others. The influence we have on others even when we don't realise. This is what J.C. Ryle wrote. Those who enter the kingdom of heaven 
should not only have an abundant supply of everything which they need for their own soul, but shall also become a source of blessing to the souls of others. The Spirit shall make that person a fountain of good for others. Does that make sense so far? That everyone who believes in Jesus Christ, you've no idea how the Spirit then uses you to be a source of blessing for others. This is what he goes on to say. No person comes into the kingdom of heaven just for themselves. The conversion of one person always leads on, thanks to God's <laughs> wonderful providence, to the conversion of others. Even if we never know this ourselves. It is far more likely, he says, that many live and die in faith who are not aware that they have done any good to another soul. But on resurrection morning and judgment day, it will be proved the promise that no person lives unto themselves. Even the penitent thief on the cross has become to others a source of blessing to thousands of souls. Some people are like rivers of living water while they live. The words they share are all means by which the water of life flows into the hearts of others. Such are the apostles who wrote no epistles and only preached the word. Some believers are rivers of living water when they die. Their courage, their boldness. All of this sets thousands thinking and hundreds to repent and believe. Some are rivers of living water long after they die. Those who wrote books and letters, left legacies. Being dead, as the Bible says, yet they speak. And some, and listen to this. I love what he says here. Some are living water by the beauty of their daily conduct and behaviour. Many who make no show and no noise and no noise in the world and yet they insensibly exercise a deep influence for good on all around them. Think not for a moment that it is only your own soul that will be saved. Think of the blessedness of being a river of the water of life for others. The kingdom of heaven is like the leaving, Jesus says. That a person takes and mixes into about 30 kilograms of flour until it is worked all the way through the dough. Amen. I see.
Let us pray. Lord God, on Christian Aid Sunday, we cast our eyes wider than normally perhaps we do. We pray for Esther and all the work that's going on in Malawi. We give thanks for her story of the pigeon peas. We pray for her and her family, young Espo. That her family grows up healthy and strong. And full of faith. Like their granny. We pray for her town, her village. And we ask your blessing on the country of Malawi. We pray for Bangladesh tonight. As news of the cyclone comes. We pray for all of that country. But particularly remember the area crowded with refugees. In temporary housing. Never designed to cope. With such natural disasters. Lord God, may your mercy be upon them tonight. We pray that the cyclone doesn't hit in the same way. Lord God, please have mercy. And watch over that part of your world tonight. Thank you, God, for hearing our prayers. And we pray closer at home. We pray for joy. We thank you for all that she gives to this church. Thank you for her deep faith. Thank you for our willingness to share her faith. And we pray for her in this difficult time. We pray for Lisa, her daughter and her family. And forgive me God, whether it's Karen or Carol and her family. Bless them, give them strength to cope. May they have the courage to pray. And may they know of a wonderful God who has blessed and will continue to bless their mum. And in the quiet, before a new week begins, we offer you, God, our own prayers. Lord God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. Amen. And so now let us go home with a peace that passes understanding, knowing that all is well, safely well. God is nigh. Amen.